This evening's reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 4, and that is page 257 if you are using the church Bible. That's 2 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, page 257 in the church Bible. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed. And all Israel was dismayed. Now Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. The name of one was Baana, and the name of the other was Rechab, sons of Rimmon, a man of Benjamin from Beeroth. For Beeroth also is counted part of Benjamin. The Beerothites fled to Gitaim and have been sojourners there to this day. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel and his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame and his name was Mephibosheth. Now the sons of Rimmon the Berethite, Rechab and Baana, set out and about the heat of the day they came to the house of Ishbosheth as he was taking his noonday rest. And they came into the midst of the house as if to get wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. When they came into the house as he lay on his bed in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and beheaded him. They took his head and went by the way of Araba all night and brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. And they said to the king, here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my lord, the king, this day on Saul and on his offspring. But David answered Rechab and Baana, his brother, the sons of Rimmon the Beerothite, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity, when one told me, behold, Saul is dead, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag which was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house on his bed, shall I not now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? And David commanded his young men and they killed them and cut off their hands and feet and hanged them beside the pool at Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner at Hebron. Well, we return to the passage that we considered last week, uh, which is 2 Samuel chapter 4, and um, basically the second half of that chapter we're going to consider this evening when the motives of the heart are revealed. And really, um, I intended to get through this chapter last week and only got halfway through it, and there's much that we need to see from the, the second half. And remember uh, that quote from Alec Motia, the Old Testament is the word of God. It exists not to record for our amusement the quaint notions of ancient men, but for our learning, imperishable principles of divine truth. And you should be praying that as we go through the life of David, these imperishable principles of divine truth would be revealed to us. But more than that, each one of us would take hold of what we hear and apply them into our lives. So let's briefly recap, just to get the context of what we're looking at tonight. Remember, Saul, the first king of Israel, is dead. He's been slain on the battlefield. David has been anointed king of Judah, just the southern part of Israel. However, we've seen very quickly a rival kingdom has been set up, and one of Saul's Sons, Ishbosheth has been made king by Saul's general Abner. Abner was this power maker, the, the king maker in the land. And uh, we saw conflict between Ishbosheth and Abner, where Abner is accused of uh, some sin and wickedness. He turns against Ishbosheth and goes over to David's side, and then 
he believes he has the power to bring all Israel uh, to submit to the kingship of David. Uh, we saw some, some, something of the arrogance of this man, Abner. He feels he really is master of his own destiny. Uh, well, he's killed. He's killed by David's commander-in-chief, Joab. And uh, he's killed in cold blood to David's displeasure. Remember last week we saw the long and winding road that leads to David's kingship. We saw the crumbling house of Saul and the warning that we saw there not to set up rival kingdoms against the kingdom of the Lord Jesus because every other kingdom will ultimately fail and that includes the kingdom of self and the kingdom of sin. And we saw the evil wickedness of the human heart as represented by Bananha and Rachab. Uh, my heart, your heart, is exposed by the word of God. Well, as we go back into chapter 4, we're going to see that the murder and the intrigue continues. Uh, what is the, the big picture that's going on? Well, it's clear that the writer is explaining to us how every opponent is being removed so that David will become king over all of Israel. This was God's plan and sovereign intention. That's the big picture, but I also believe there are some very important other lessons that we need to draw from what's going on here. And here we see these two men, as presented to us, Rachab and Benhanah. Uh, verse 8, they've murdered Ishbosheth. They've now taken the head of Ishbosheth to David. And verse 8, how does it read? Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the, so the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my lord the king this day on Saul and his offspring. So that's where we sort of didn't quite get to last week, where these men commit the murder. Now they've gone to David. It's a gruesome, evil murder, murdering a man in his own bedroom when he's going down to rest in the midday. And clearly they come to David and they present themselves with the very best of intentions, don't they? Uh, they are God's servants and God's instruments. So let me just draw some lessons out from verse 8 initially. There are times when God-centered talk are used to disguise man-centered motives. That's what we see here, isn't it? These two men are, are claiming to be the vengeful instruments in God's hands. They're the instruments of judgment and vengeance. They claim they're carrying out God's will in God's way. But the writer has already given us plenty of clues that this is far from reality. Now, now, obviously, a sovereign God is overruling this gross wickedness and sin, and it was that, to murder a man on his own bed, uh, is completely against the revealed will of God. But our God is sovereign, overruling even the most wicked of sins. But we see their cowardice. These brave men, they can murder a man on his own bed whilst he's sleeping. We see the opportunist uh, agenda, the greed that they are showing. They've heard about the death of Abner. Now they believe they can get on the inside track into David's kingdom by removing this rival king and bringing his head to David. There's no real honor or integrity here. There's no genuine courage or humility, is there? And if we're honest, again, holding up the mirror of God's word to our own hearts, these two men actually speak to us more than we would like to admit. And again, one of my favorite commentators, commentators on the Old Testament, Dilrab Davis, says this, the Banhanas and uh, Rechabs are still existing. Some are in our churches. Their methodology is unchanged. Use theology to 
cover sin and folly. For them, theology is not truth that lures us to worship God, but technique that enables us to justify ourselves. So we can be harsh and then say something about God's truth to cover our severity. We can be indifferent and then use something about God's holiness as a, a cover for our indifference and separation from someone in need. We can befriend people and invite them into our homes to get our own way. We can rationalize and use something about God's grace to cover our own impurity. Whether we are telling this something to ourselves or to someone else, when we speak about God's truth, when we present God's truth, we desperately need to check our own hearts. What is the motive of my heart? Well, the Lord knows, maybe no one else will know, but the Lord knows. And that's a very sobering and realistic and challenging truth, isn't it? So, so really, my first point in being at work, there's a call to discernment, a discernment of our own hearts and the agendas of our own hearts and the agendas and motives of someone else's hearts. Now, you may not be able to discern that. You don't have an x-ray vision into someone else's heart. You know, uh, sometimes I play chess, play online, and not very good, but normally I can explain to you why I move my knight to f6. But a really good chess player will be able to understand and explain why their opponent has moved their bishop to b2. Uh, there's that understanding why they are making a move and why their opponent is doing the same as well. Now, I'm not calling you to a, a critical and a cynical approach to people, just a loving discernment of your own heart and the motives of others. As the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We need, we really need that balance. Grace should be the, the default position and approach of our hearts, but discernment really is required with our own hearts and with dealing with other people. Second important principle we can take from this chapter is God's righteous king will serve as a judge who judges the motives of our hearts. That's what we see David doing here. He's presented as a man after God's own heart. Now, in a few chapters' time, we will see you know, some great sin presented in David's life. But nevertheless, he's still uh, portrayed as the ideal king initially, isn't he? And when these murdering opportunists come to him, David judges them as he should. Now, I said last week he didn't deal with Joab, and he should have. Joab murdered Abner, and just before he died, David said to Solomon, his son, you deal with him because I haven't, and I should have. And if you, you know what happens to Joab, you, you know that he's... Uh, killed as holding on to the horns of the altar. And um, Solomon sees that he's struck down for what he's done. David didn't exercise judgment on him, but he does on these men, and he does so rightly, because he's being presented as the righteous king who will bring judgment against wickedness and sin. And he's pointing us to the, the great king and the ultimate king in the right sense here, that the Lord Jesus himself will bring a judgment. We can read about this, for example, um, connected to the resurrection, Acts 17, verses 30 to 31. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Isn't that powerful, that God commands you and I to repent. God commands the people of Cobner and the people of Portsmouth and the people of the UK to repent and the people of the world to repent. That's the command of God. 
Why? Because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he's given assurance. How do we know that a judgment day is certain? By raising him, Jesus, from the dead. And so Jesus, the son of David, is both king and judge. Well, praise God, he's also saviour. But here the emphasis is on him being the judge. Remember what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth? Remember he's writing to believers here. And in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Remember I just said, there's no hiding your heart from the Lord. Then each one will receive his condemnation from God. Commendation, sorry, from God. And then another verse, again to Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due, what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And these passages are powerful, particularly the ones in Corinth, because Paul is speaking to who? He's speaking to Christians. And that day of judgment, I believe, will be an, an awesome day. Uh, the believer, of course, knows that the one who is judge is also saviour, and we are in Christ. But that day, indeed, will expose the motives of our hearts. And so these are very sobering and challenging truths that we are looking at this evening. We need to ask the Lord, therefore, in the light of what I've said, to deal with us on a heart level. Oh, may the Holy Spirit be the great sanctifier of our hearts. May our motives be true and pure before the Lord. That we would live lives pleasing to the Lord. Perhaps when no one else is looking, that we would put the Lord first. We'd seek his glory and not our own. We also want to look at the next point, which is this. A life controlled by me-centered mo motives will end in severe judgment. And it's graphically portrayed for us in this chapter, isn't it? David pronounces a swift and an immediate judgment against these murderers. And as they are executed, they are hands and feet are cut off and their bodies are put on display at the town watering hole in Hebron. It sounds awfully brutal, but barbaric, does it not? Why do this? Why mutilate the bodies? Why do this to their hands and their feet? Well, commentators differ, but I, I think the, the best way to understand what's going on here is to understand what's written in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, and verses 16 to 18, where we read six things that the Lord hates, seven things that are an abomination to him, and it includes hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, and feet that make haste to run to evil. So I believe that David's judgment here is not only casting shame on these men, but exposing the wickedness of their acts as they perform them. This is a severe judgment. And I mentioned it last week that, and the week before that the writer of Samuel is going to great lengths to make sure that David is separated from these murderous plots and schemes that were supposedly done for his benefit. We are to understand David isn't that kind of king. In the same way, when Jesus, the son of David, returns to judge, there will be a severe consequence for those whose lives are dominated by selfish intentions. 
these men, Banana and Rahab, they clearly point us to those sobering words of Jesus. You know, these men are pretending to be God's instruments, God's uh, vessels who will execute judgment, but they are exposed for their evil and wickedness. And Matthew 7 is one of the most challenging and terrifying parts of God's word. Remember, as Jesus is drawing the Sermon on the Mount to a conclusion, remember what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And verse 22 of Matthew 7, I find this verse really terrifying. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Or we could add, did we not kill in your name? Did we not carry out God's vengeance in your name? Connected to our story, of course. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus certainly doesn't pull his punches here. I say that in a reverent way. Many will say to me on that day. That's terrifying, isn't it? And so we need to understand that a true believer, their life is dominated by the Holy Spirit and the reality of the Spirit in our lives. We may sin, but we cannot go on sinning. We cannot sin in an indifferent or an unconcerned way. There is a constant battle in our lives between sin and repentance and reformation, and that's the working of God's Spirit. So please don't understand me, I'm not standing here and saying, you know, the Christian life is sinless perfection all the way to heaven, it would be wonderful if that's the case, but no, God's grace and the work of God's Spirit is seen in the struggle and in the sin, but in the repentance and reformation and sanctifying work of God's Spirit. But those who claim to be followers of Christ, but live completely indifferently and in consistency, uh, not with any work of the Spirit in their lives. Those who are contented with a me-focused approach to life, whether it's greed or pride or indifference or lust or whatever it is, Jesus would call such people hypocrites. And one day, each person will be exposed. No matter what the length of their Christian service or their impressive so-called Christian CV, heart issues will be exposed. So we really need to check our hearts tonight. Are we followers of Christ on a heart level, believing and trusting on him from that inner part of the real us, that we've really committed our ways to Christ and truly repented of our sins. But now let's look at perhaps something certainly more positive, God's righteous king and the good news of deliverance. I'd like us to focus on verse 9. And it really is a striking statement that David makes. As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. Now, that could be the the title of this entire series on the life of David, couldn't it? The Lord has redeemed my life out of every adversity. That's a great summary testimony of the deliverance that David has experienced. It really is. Do you understand what David is saying to these two murderers in front of him? He's basically saying, you're claiming to be working for the Lord, for my benefit. I do not need such input to see my kingdom established. I don't need this wicked, evil, murderous plan that you've hatched. 
as the Lord lives, he's, he's the one who's redeemed my life out of every adversity. And isn't it uh, interesting, in verse 11, he describes Isbosheth as a righteous man who was killed on his own bed. I think David is showing a lot of grace there against a rival king and an enemy, actually, of the kingdom of God as well. But here David is presenting something wonderful and precious. And what a wonderful, clear testimony that is to us, isn't it? And I believe that every Christian, every believer should be able to say something similar. Now, you and I are not David, but we know the same Lord. Yes, David is in a unique position in God's redemptive plan, but each of us know divine, sovereign, providential care, grace, protection on a daily basis. David knew that God was able to fulfill his will and bring his kingdom without the help of these two men in front of him. He's David's great redeemer. And he points us to these great realities. Yes, there's a, a great king who will be a righteous judge, but this righteous judge, at the same time, at the same time, is the redeemer of those who trust in him. So if we are to be judged by our motives, and we will be, who more than anyone in the world would you want to judge you? Well, the one who's died in your place, who suffered your punishment, died as a substitute and a saviour of your sin and wrong heart motives. The cross of the Lord Jesus was God's way and God's day. We saw this this morning, didn't we, that Jesus is in control of all the events leading up to his death. He's not overtaken by, by plots of wicked men. Whilst wicked men are involved, they, they're doing exactly what God had foreordained would happen at the time that God had ordained it to be. He delivers us from every adversity, every difficulty, may not immediately in this life, maybe not at all, but certainly in the life to come. I read a quote from Spurgeon today where he said, we have known bereavement after bereavement, but we are going, we are going home to a place where there is no graveyards. And that's the great hope that we have because the one who is judge is also redeemer. As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it? God advances his kingdom by preserving his servants and fulfilling his purpose despite the, the plots of evil, wicked men. Even when men gather their collected strength and band together against the Lord and against his anointed, the great sovereign God sees the rebellion, this corporate rebellion, Psalm 2, and what does he do? He laughs and establishes his royal king anyway. The advance of God's kingdom cannot be thwarted by any human means. So David is saying in verse 9, I do not need this kind of help, and I reject this kind of evil, wicked help that you've brought me. Why? Because the Lord who lives, he has redeemed my life out of every adversity. No one can stand in his way. And I'm resolved to trust him. Remember when we are first introduced to David? Uh, he's anointed as king in 1 Samuel 16. And then in chapter 17, he's got a real giant of a problem to face. He's going to go into battle against Goliath. And Saul, who's not his enemy then, says to him, you're just a, a boy. You're a teenage lad. You can't go and fight against this skilled, powerful giant of a man. And what does David say to Saul? Well, he doesn't say, well, don't you know how special I am? Don't you know I've got the, the skills? You know, I'm... No, he says nothing of that. He says, 
The Lord delivered me. The Lord delivered me out of the hand of the bear and the paw of the lion. And so I'm a living testimony of God's deliverance out of every adversity the Lord has redeemed me. So David begins his life with that kind of testimony. And 25 years later, these words are still found on his lips. It's a daily, consistent testimony of a man who's walking with the Lord. Not only has he been delivered from danger, from lion and bear and giants and Saul's attempts to take his life on numerous occasions, he's also been rescued and delivered from his own heart. Can you remember, is it 1 Samuel 25, where this foolish man, Nabal by name, Nabal by nature, is asked by David to provide supplies for him and his men, and Nabal curses David and refuses to help him, and David is so angry by the insults and the lack of help from Nabal, he gathers his men, marches towards the camp of Nabal in order to kill him and all his men. And then Abigail, Nabal's wife, comes to him and intercedes and brings the supplies that Nabal should have supplied. And then she says to him, Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hands, now then, let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord, be as Nabal. And uh, this is a test to me, because the Lord did judge Nabal. Remember, he, he died very shortly after these events, and Abigail is saying, look, the Lord is restraining you, David. He's redeeming you from your own heart's desires. Out of every adversity, the Lord has redeemed my life. That's the the great, great testimony. She realizes that David had every intention of behaving in a very wicked way. But even there, when David's heart is wrong, the Lord is showing providential overruling and grace. Isn't that the, the testimony that you can have tonight as you reflect back on your life? The Lord's redeeming, the Lord's preserving, the Lord's saving you from adversity, from an unseen enemy, but he's very present and very active against us here this evening. Then against threats and dangers that we perhaps even are not even aware that we've been brought through. And then certainly we know what's going on inside here. And if the Lord withdrew his hand and let us do exactly what our hearts wanted to do. Well, where would you and I be tonight? It would be horrendous to think about that, wouldn't it? That's what we saw last week. The long and winding road is overseen all the way by a providential, protecting, gracious hand of God. Now, I don't know, in conclusion, what the new heavens and the new earth would be like. I would love to think, I don't know this, but I would love to think that you would be able to speak to some of these people from God's word face to face. Um, I don't know if I'll ever be able to speak to David. I know I'll see the Lord. That's the most important thing, isn't it? So anything I else I say now is to be filtered through the, the great glory of the new heavens and the new earth is being with, with, with Jesus and having fellowship with him. But will, I, will you be able to speak to, to David? I don't know, but I think one of the questions I'd like to ask him is, um, David, what, what do you think of that great lovely hymn that we used to sing so often? Of his deliverance I will boast Till all that are distressed from my example, courage take and soothe their griefs to rest. Now, uh, that's the hymn through all the changing scenes of life. And I became aware 
that um, there are other verses to that hymn this last week. And one of the verses we've never sung, and we should sing it, because it goes like this. Behold, they say, behold the man whom providence relieved, the man so dangerously beset, so wonderfully retrieved. Isn't that David's great testimony? That's what we we see. As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. And if I ever get to talk to David, I'm sure he would endorse such truths of those hymns. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. Let's pray. Lord our God, we would want you to search our hearts and know us and deal with us on a heart level. You know the motives of our hearts, they're not hidden from you. We pray tonight for pure motives and for a heart of trust in your providential ways as we seek to live holy to your glory and for your kingdom. And we pray, bring your kingdom in your time, in your way. And we pray that you would save us from ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.